Cyberpunk was once described to me as high-tech, low-life. For this reason, Shadowrun wouldn't be much of a cyberpunk setting without an equivalent to one of the most pervasive pieces of technology we've got in the modern age. The Internet. In Shadowrun, this takes the form of... The Matrix. And it wouldn't be much of a fantasy game if it didn't include some kind of computer wizard archetype. The Technomancer in Shadowrun. These topics and more from Shadowrun Sixth World are what we're going to be talking about today. As I stated in the introduction, The Matrix is Shadowrun's equivalent of the internet. It's like if every major city had free Wi-Fi across their city limits. And much like in our world, almost every electronic device we have can be connected to The Matrix. Our world has cars and printers that connect to the internet for firmware updates. I have a video camera that can directly connect to the internet via Wi-Fi for uploading things to YouTube. And I've even seen Wi-Fi enabled stereo systems, slow cookers, and even air conditioning units. Basically, being able to be operated via a smartphone is a feature that some people are willing to pay a premium for. And Shadowrun carries this to its logical conclusion, that a device that can be feasibly connected to the Matrix will be. The stated purpose is convenience. The insidious purpose is to monitor what you do with the thing. Either so you can be profiled based on how you use it and then be advertised to more effectively, or so you can be reported to the authorities if you do something you're not supposed to. There is even the equivalent to smartphones in Shadowrun called COM links. They're an equal part computing device for accessing the Matrix to tell people their opinions are wrong because it points out something that makes you uncomfortable, operating all your household gadgets without having to leave your room, or calling people up to inanely listen in silence to one another because you both know communication is an important part of human relationships, but you forgot to develop a personality and thus lack things to talk about. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, using the Matrix. Interfacing with the Matrix through a device like a comlink is just one way to use the Matrix. There's also augmented reality and virtual reality. Augmented reality is also a technology from our world, where a video stream of the real world has additional data and imagery imposed over it. While it's not as common for us, it's everywhere in Shadowrun, especially since special glasses and ocular implants are common enough to make it possible to easily impose that extra information over whatever it is we see. These extra tidbits of information are called augmented reality objects, or arrows, and when you're looking through augmented reality, it's kind of like looking through the world with a heads-up display out of a video game. Except that there's also advertisements everywhere. Virtual reality, by contrast, accesses the Matrix much differently. It's like being in a completely different world. Your persona can look like whatever you want, and every object that you have that's connected to your comlink also appears with you as a similar object. In fact, everything connected to the Matrix appears as something else. Hosts, what we know as websites, appear as buildings. Files would appear as books or old-school floppy or compact disks. Basically, Virtual Reality Matrix is a lot like what the 1980s movies thought being a hacker on the internet was like. It's a copy of our world you don't have to physically move around in. Comlinks let you use the Matrix. But to do the fun stuff, you need a cyberdeck. In this edition of Shadowrun, they're like computers that fit on the back of your wrist like a gauntlet or something. When in the Matrix, your physical attributes are not used. You instead have four Matrix attributes. Attack, Sleaze, Data Processing, and Firewall. Shadowrun's Sixth World describes these attributes as follows. Attack is the offensive power of a device. Sleaze is the stealth power of a device. Data processing is the raw computing power of a device and determines how many programs you can run with it. And firewall is the device's ability to stop any kind of intrusion, overt or covert. These stats come from the devices you're connecting to the matrix with, as well as the devices you have slaved together. 
meaning you can connect to the Matrix with just a cyber deck, but you'll only have an attack and sleaze rating. You'll need a comlink, or better yet, a cyberjack, to get some data processing and firewall. An important thing to note is that the attack and sleaze of a cyber deck can be swapped out as a minor action. Also, there's a few programs you can get that give you some extra abilities when you're out on the Matrix. Some are perfectly legal, listed as basic programs. Others are hacking programs, and using them can invite disaster. Decking calls on three different skills. Electronics, which is used for all your legal actions on the Matrix. Cracking is used for illegal actions, like getting into things that you're not supposed to be in. And engineering is used to repair damaged equipment. Performing Matrix actions follows a similar flow to combat. The first step is you form a dice pool, using electronics and logic if it is a legal action, or cracking in logic if it is illegal. The defender's dice pool depends on what action you're using. Then you distribute edge. In cyber combat, you compare the attack and defense. Whomever has four or higher than their opponent gets an extra point of edge. Attack is attack and sleaze, and defense is data processing and firewall. Some programs may affect edge gains, so consider those as well. Then you roll the dice. This is simple enough. Roll the dice, count the hits, whoever has more wins. And then you determine the effect based on the actions right up. There's a lot of matrix actions, and most of them involve interacting with icons, devices, files, personas, or even hosts. Depending on your access level to that icon, you can perform different actions. The access levels are Outsider, User, and Admin. By default, you have admin access to your icons and outsider access to others. However, there are two actions that can give you higher access levels, Brute Force and Probe. Brute Force is faster, but makes it obvious what you're trying to do. Probe takes more time, but allows you to follow up later with the action Backdoor Entry. The key difference between these two actions is that Brute Force immediately increases Overwatch score, while Probe and Backdoor Entry do not. Overwatch score, by the way, is a rating of how likely you are to be detected for doing illegal things on the Matrix. There's three things that can increase your Overwatch score. Using a hacking program, maintaining illegal access, acquired through the Brute Force action, and performing illegal actions. All illegal actions, whether you succeed or fail, can raise your Overwatch score equal to the number of hits that the Defender gets. So even if the Defender can't fend you off, they can still cause what's called a Convergence. Convergence is what happens when your Overwatch score hits 40. You get forcibly ejected from the Matrix, dealing Dump Shock, and your physical location is reported to the local authorities, who may or may not seek you out and decide to question you at the end of a gun barrel about just what you were doing on the Matrix. Hosts are an important thing to discuss if you want to understand the Matrix. They have Matrix attributes, just like your equipment does, and a host's attributes are shared with all of its intrusion countermeasures, or ICE. ICE, of course, are programs that exist solely to cause hackers grief for trying to get into hosts that they have no business being in. They're just one of the security measures of hosts, though. Another is that a host can be inside another host. Think of it like this. If the Matrix is a neighborhood, a host could be a house in that neighborhood. The door is locked. Then, inside that house, they could have a basement door that's also locked. And in that basement, there could be a side room that is still locked. Hosts can nest the same way requiring you to break into multiple hosts to get access to a file or device that you're looking for. Which, this can be dangerous, since your Overwatch score increases for every host that you have illegal access to. In the end, it means this. Sometimes, it might just be easier to physically break into the building that's storing the machine you're trying to hack into, instead of going several hosts deep. If using the Matrix was perfectly safe, there'd be no reason to do anything but be a Decker in Shadowrun. Earlier, I mentioned ICE, spelled with two letters, I and C. 
It stands for Intrusion Countermeasures. These are programs that make it harder for Deckers to do the stuff they're not supposed to. And if we continue with our house analogy, this is like if Kevin McAllister were in charge of security in the house. In addition to all kinds of locks, there'd be a bunch of nasty traps that do all kinds of things, ranging from just keeping an eye on intruders, slowing them down in some way, or even engaging in some sadistic and painful attacks. Mechanically, every ice you encounter has very simple stats. Their attack rolls, attack rating, and condition monitor are equal to double that of their host. The effects of an ice are what vary, and there's a short list of them on pages 186 and 187. All devices used to access the matrix have a condition monitor. This is equal to 8 plus half of the device's rating. Certain actions on the matrix, like data spike, can cause matrix damage. As a device takes damage, it becomes less useful, in the form of a minus one penalty for every three damage that it takes, rounded down. When it's completely full on damage, something snaps, there's some crackling, and you better believe there's a pop or two. It stops working. And if it stops this way while you're still using it, you have to deal with dump shock, which I'll explain further in a few moments. Link lock is another important concept, since there's a few hacking programs in ICE that can cause this. Link lock is a state where you can't safely disconnect from the matrix, meaning if you get overwhelmed by a bunch of ICE while link locked, you're going to have to make the difficult choice of fighting your way out or disconnecting abruptly. By this, I mean if you manage to disconnect with the jack out action, you'll have dump shock to deal with which may still be better than having your brain fried by black ice. Dumb shock is what happens when you're abruptly kicked off the matrix for one reason or another. The results of it are you take three points of damage, either stun or physical damage depending on if you are running cold or hot sim while in VR. You also lose the ability to gain or use edge for a certain amount of time, equal to 10 minutes minus one minute for each point of willpower that you have. Everything so far has been about Deckers, people who use computer hardware to use and abuse the Matrix. Let's switch gears and talk about Technomancers now. Literal computer wizards. First things first, Technomancers don't need equipment to access the Matrix. They just do it on their own, with their mind. Their Matrix attributes are determined by their mental attributes, per this chart. Attack is equal to Charisma, Sleaze is equal to Intuition, Data Processing is equal to Logic, and Firewall is equal to Willpower. In addition, Technomancers also get their Resonance Rating as a pool of bonus points they can spend to temporarily raise their Matrix attributes. These bonus points don't go away, and can even be switched around using the Reconfigure Matrix Attribute action. The limitations, however, are that you can't raise your attributes to be higher than half of their base, nor can they be raised by more than four, whichever is lower. For example, a five charisma technomancer with three resonance would have just enough to raise their attack to eight, but if they were resonance four, they couldn't raise their attack even higher, they'd have to use their extra points somewhere else. Technomancers also have access to all the Matrix actions that Deckers do, but they can't use programs. Instead, they gain special abilities called Complex Forms. Using a Complex Form calls for an Electronics and Resonance test, with the amount of hits you get usually determining how effective the Complex Form was. But here is one of my major gripes with Shadowrun 6e. They don't really explain fading. It's not in the index, and all references to it point to page 189, which doesn't specify anything about fading other than three quick sentences without much context. The best I can figure is that it's similar to Drain from spellcasting as it was in Shadowrun 5th edition. The fading value is how dangerous it is to use a given complex form. You then roll willpower and logic, with each hit reducing the fading value. This reduced value is the damage you take as a result of using this complex form. If the amount of fading you take is less than or equal to your resonance, you take that as stun damage, but if it is higher, you take that as physical. 
In other words, slinging around complex forms can be hazardous to your health, especially if you're a weak-willed moron. And if computer spells weren't enough, technomancers can also risk fading to compile sprites, a sort of spirit that lives in the matrix that can perform tasks for the technomancer. In order to do this, the technomancer decides on the level of the sprite they wish to compile. The level of the sprite will determine not only the difficulty of compiling it, but also how high their attributes and skills are. Once you've decided on the level of the sprite, you roll tasking and resonance to bring it into the matrix against double the level of the sprite. If you succeed, you can make it perform a number of commands equal to your net hits. However, every hit the sprite gets is a point of fading that has to be resisted, just like if you used a complex form. And this always causes at least two points of fading. Sprites are not recognized by the Matrix as legitimate code, and so it will try to unmake them. This means they stick around for double their level in hours. So stronger sprites are also able to wait around longer for you to give them orders. If you want to keep your sprite for longer than a few hours though, you need to register them, which calls for another tasking and resonance roll against twice its level. This also causes fading, just like when you compiled it. The plus side to registering a sprite, however, is that your net successes get added to how many tasks it can do. It stays indefinitely, and it gains a few new options. And if that wasn't enough to convince you about the utility of registering sprites, it also lets you have more sprites, since the number of sprites you can have registered is equal to your resonance. Plus, you're allowed to have one more sprite that is not registered. This means a patient technomancer that's really good at tasking can get a small army of sprites to do their dirty work for them. The last thing to mention about technomancers is submersion. This is how technomancers gain more power. They, well, submerge themselves into the very source of their powers, the resonance. When they come out, they have a higher maximum resonance as well as a power called an echo, which is yet another toy that technomancers have in their toolbox. I want to close this video with some more good and bad notes about the Matrix in this edition of Shadowrun. The good is that the Matrix is now somewhat simpler than in previous editions, both in terms of how it works and how the mechanics for interacting with it work. That's unfortunately where the good points end, though. The bad is that there's some uncreative and unhelpful explanations. Attack and sleaze are simply described as the attack and stealth rating of the Matrix. Those descriptions get the point across, yes, but it feels less like I'm using these stats to slice my way into computer systems and more like I'm just playing cyber D&D. There's also a couple of other bizarre statements that don't particularly explain anything, or don't explain anything well. It feels a bit like, in the interest of avoiding going overboard with details like they did in 5th edition, they erred on the side of cutting things out to make it all shorter. Fading, however, could really have stood to be better explained, especially since they were able to devote that page space to its magical equivalent, Drain. It might be redundant to do so, but it's better than hoping that a reader will make the connection on how Drain and Fading are similar on their own. I mean, if they're new to Shadowrun, and they know they don't want to be a mage, so they skip that chapter, then they only get three brief sentences to explain fading. Hot Sim is also significantly weaker in Shadowrun 6e, with the changes to initiative from 5th edition. In 5e, your initiative determined how many actions you got. Every action reduced your initiative by 10. So, a higher initiative meant that you had a lot more actions, or you could use certain interrupt actions more often, like dodging out of turn at the cost of 5 initiative. And Hot Sim and 5e also gave you bonus dice on top of that higher initiative, making the possibility of dying more worth the risk of using it. By contrast, speed is the only benefit you get from Hot Sim in 6th edition. And since action economy it gives less reward to higher initiative in this edition, it's become more situational instead of high risk, high reward. This is one of the sections in Shadowrun 6e that I think is much lower quality. It's mechanically simpler than 5e, but 
its explanations aren't quite as good as they could be. Thanks for watching! If you found this video helpful or useful, give me a thumbs up like. And if you want to know more about Shadowrun or other role-playing games, check out some of my other videos, or even subscribe! With all that said, I am Arundam Shadel, and I will see you all next time, chummers.